Hey guys, Stockaholics, thanks for being here today. This video will be investigating bulkers, sharing some of my thoughts after looking at this space for a little while now, sharing my first impressions. Some of the uh, content in this video might be a little dry, pun intended, if you are familiar with the space, because I'll be talking about the vessels themselves, what these things carry, and then we'll be moving into um, shipping cycles, uh, correlation between the uh, the Baltic index and uh, share prices of public companies, and then we'll also look at I think some of the um, uh, the order book as well as uh, scrapping that has taken place uh, recently over the past few years in the space. By the way, in this video, I'll merely be scratching the surface of the bulkers. If you are interested in some more deeper dives into the space. Be on the lookout for those videos coming up in the near future. Okay, there are four main types of ships in the dry bulk segment. There are more outside of this list, but I think it's important to understand these four to get a big picture view of the dry bulk segment. You have your handy size. They carry the smallest amount of deadweight ton of cargo. They account for about 34% of the global dry fleet. Uh, these percentages might be a little off. This is from a little bit older of an article. Then you have your handy maxes or your super max ships. They carry a little bit more deadweight tonnage. They're about 37%. Got your Panamaxes. Uh, they, these ships carry 60,000 to 80,000, a little bit more than the handies um, and the handy maxes. <laughs> They account for about 20%. And then you have your Cape size, the, the largest of this uh, group. Not the largest uh, period, but the largest of this group of the most common uh, dry bulk ships. These carry 100,000 deadweight tons of cargo, and they are too big for the Panama Canal. Now, the reason I think it's important to understand the different types, um, especially compared to another segment like uh, oil tankers, is because a lot of these different uh, types of vessels often carry uh, different types of cargoes. But uh, just like oil tankers in extreme depressed markets, a lot of that can uh, shift. It's, it's just in terms of economics, what is the most efficient uh, type of cargo to carry over <laughs> different routes? And different sizes can do that more efficiently usually than others. Okay, I cover tankers a lot, oil tanker segment. When you get into uh, dry bulk, it, it's it starts to get a lot more complicated to me. And the reason for that is because dry bulk, there is just so many different kinds of cargoes. When you're talking about oil tankers, you have basically your crude and your product segment. And then you maybe have some niche chemical segments, right? In dry bulk, you have just all of these different bulk products that uh, make up global trade, okay? They're just unpackaged, <laughs> different things like we'll get into in a second. But there's two main types of these, these cargoes. These are the major and the minor bulks. So I'll give you some examples. Some examples of major dry bulk commodities include iron ore, coal, and grain. What's interesting though, um, you'd think there might be just ships that would carry these one types of commodities back and forth. That's, that's not at all how it works. In fact, uh, a dry bulk carrier in one load might carry iron ore or coal, and then the next load carry some grains. What they actually have to do is they get some workers, they go into inside of the hulls of the vessels and they, they wash them out and they make them food grade, <laughs> those cargo uh, areas, they make them food grade ready. So there's, it just depends on uh, <laughs> what, what ship gets what kind of cargo, I guess. So these major bulks account for nearly two thirds of global dry bulk trade. So if you are uh, interested in a, bull case or a bear case in the dry bulk segment, you would probably most want to consider those uh, major bulk uh, segments. The, that is your iron ore, your coal, and your, your grains. Yeah, But there is the minor bulks, and they matter too. They're about a third of the, uh, the, uh, the overall uh, dry bulk segment. These are your steel bulk, uh, steel products, sugars, cement, and those cover, like I said, about the remaining one third. So coal, along with iron ore, it's one of the most traded dry bulk commodities. 
by volume. Countries most involved in the importation of coal for their primary energy and electricity needs are India, China, and Japan. I was looking at, I think there's like a, like a bubble chart I saw somewhere where you look at the countries that most import using these uh, dry bulk vessels. China is by far and away the largest one. And relative to China, the United States is just like a fraction <laughs> of uh, total uh, dry bulk uh, volume. I think, don't quote me on this, but I believe most of the demand for these vessels strongly comes from the east. Grain is another major cargo in terms of seaborne dry bulk trade and accounts for the total dry bulk trade worldwide. All right, over here, I have commodity share per segment. So one of the interesting things about the different um, sizes of the vessels, which is why I brought them up in the last slide, is that they tend to, under normal conditions, carry different types of cargoes. Uh, there's reasons for this. It, I think a lot of it has to do with efficiency, especially when we're talking about routes and where the, these different commodities need to go. But that doesn't mean that different types of ships will not carry different types of cargoes under different conditions. So in my opinion, the most important thing overall to consider is the overall deadweight tonnage versus the uh, the demand of that versus the supply of the availability of that uh, that for these guys to the cargoes to deliver that right but there is efficiencies and i think it is important to consider it first of all your cape size type vessels those are the largest ones they tend to carry iron ore a very large amount of it and as well as coal so these guys are very heavily involved in major dry bulk segments right um they also tend to deliver a small amount of bauxite. By the way, bauxite, if I didn't mention that, is used to produce aluminum. You have your Panamaxes. They are heavily involved in iron ore and coal, but they deliver some grains as well as some other minor bulks. And then you notice as you get into these smaller segments, they go very heavily into the different uh, minor bulk commodities, right? So your Supras and your Handy Sizes, they're getting, they're delivering 52% minor as and a handy size, 64%. Okay, I'm gonna briefly mention this. This is the Baltic Dry Index. It is the most commonly used measure of the overall freight rates that different dry bulk carriers are earning. So the Baltic Dry Index is issued daily by the London-based Baltic Exchange, the BDI, and I'm going to use this to compare some things in a moment, is a composite of the Cape Size, Panamax, and Supermax time charter averages. It is reported around the world as a proxy for dry bulk shipping stocks, as well as a general shipping market bellwether. You can see right now we are in a tremendous bull market for dry bulk. It's been a long time coming, many would say. Um, I'll get into uh, some of that sentiment in, in a bit, right? In my opinion, right, and, and I know a lot of people didn't like to hear that when I was talking about the uh, the containers. In my opinion, this is largely an extrinsic event. The reason that we see uh, we have seen such high amounts of uh, rates for these different dry bulk carriers is number one because of COVID shenanigans, a lot of ports. There's a lot of issues <laughs> delivering said cargoes. There's issues with crews getting COVID, stuff like that. But third, there is actually, um, and th this could last, all of these, by the way, all of these could last longer than I anticipate. That's for you to decide for an investment case, I suppose. But the third is actually, uh, there's some politics right now between Australia and um, China, right? We mentioned that iron ore, is one of those big commodities being shipped on the uh, these different vessels with no um, iron ore being delivered largely from Australia. Uh, China doesn't necessarily suddenly have <laughs> no demand for that ore. They have to get it from elsewhere and they are getting that from um, regions in the world that are much farther away relative to um, Australia. So that increases the ton mile demand for these different dry bulk carriers and as a result you see very high rates in pair with some of the other things i mentioned okay i wanted to show you guys this this i'm going to be comparing the bdi the baltic dry index to the performance in some different 
dry bulk shipping stocks. The reason I wanted to show you guys this is to show that there is a very strong relationship between rates and subsequent earnings in these companies and their performance <laughs> in the uh, stock market. The reason I'm mentioning this is largely because I've heard, I um, won't use names, I've heard a shipping analyst recently say in the container ship market that um, that there isn't necessarily a correlation between <laughs> between shipping rates and um, share price performance. And um, in my opinion, that is at best uh, naive and at worst completely disingenuous. So I wanted to show you guys this. This is the dry bulk index, this blue line over here. And as you can see from 2003 to 2008, like many other shipping segments, there was something called the super cycle where there was a tremendous amount of earnings in the dry bulk segment, largely coming from China, but also the other um, BRICs in terms of demand, where the uh, there simply just was not enough vessels on the market to meet demand, right? Now, uh, this orange line down here is GOGL. It is a uh, bulker stock, and it is one of the oldest ones. And I wanted to overlay that, this, this orange line here. And you can see that they tend to move there might be a little bit of a lag with the index, but they tend to move with each other, right? You can also see that this some of these stocks, <laughs> during a uh, market euphoria, there was a lot of companies that listed during this, this super cycle. You, and by the way, these are one of the signs in cyclicals and uh, all shipping segments that should put some uh, red flags in your head if you're considering <laughs> investing when number one there's a tremendous amount of earnings in these companies and number two when you see public listings of some companies now after 2008 we i think many of us know what happened there was a global financial crisis and uh, at the same time there was just a dramatic <laughs> drop in in uh, the bdi the the rates and as a result we can see here uh, a lot of these 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 shipping stocks just crash. I know it might be a little difficult. I also have uh, SB down here and SBLK. These are also dry bulk shipping stocks. Now, after that 2008 crash, there was a tremendous amount of vessels on the water, vast oversupply of them because of. <laughs> Uh, the amount of earnings like all shipping segments when times are good they order ships when times are really good they order a ton of ships the bulker segment was no different than tankers or container ships in that regard right now you can see there was uh, a little bounce here in 2009 2010 um, for some reason this one <laughs> some of these I think there was a lot of maybe some anticipation that things might be reverting to normal as there are signs the economy was we recovering but i think there was a lot of vessels that were ordered in the years prior that hit the market uh, at this time so that no matter what the demand side was doing the supply side just overwhelmed that in terms of the amount of vessels and ultimately that led, led to in the years following a lot of these share prices falling but you can see that there are these small minor cycles and i'm going to go into that in 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 a second where you see some volatility in the, the Baltic Dry Index every few years. And as a result, when those, those rates go up, you see share prices go up, right? Over time, where we are today, we have recently gone into that, what I have uh, determined, perhaps falsely, perhaps accurately, an extrinsic event has also led to a lot of these share price movements going up in some of these um, companies. I saw this recently, and by the way, this is from the Fed. This is from the D uh, Dallas Fed. They did a study on dry bulk freight rate over the last, you know, I don't know, 170 or so years. And I wanted to show you this because there's a few interesting things about it. I haven't finished reading through their whole paper. I will. I do want to read through it though, and I'll probably put a link to that if you guys are interested in it. I find I find it strange that <laughs> I guess they are interested in economics, much like myself. But anyway, um, this blue line is the long, the average dry bulk uh, can, uh, rates that over the long run, and this red is uh, short rates in uh, the actual rates, not the averages. Yeah. 
to me, there these two lines represent two things that you see in shipping. Number one, the blue line represents long cycles. They're the long-term trends, and and shipping the average. Uh, long-term shipping cycles about 50 or so years they're very long a lot of this has to do with technology and uh, I'll explain that one in a bit too but you can see with these red lines here especially over here and especially over here number one that there's a lot of volatility <laughs> in shipping in terms of rates and number two we also have short cycles along with those long cycles. Now, I don't know the exact amount, um, the average for the uh, dry bulk segment. I'd imagine it's about four years. That's what it has been in the, uh, the tanker market. Um, but you should be aware of that too. Typically, what you want to do in terms of a shipping investment, in my opinion, not investment advice, you want to try and be getting in towards uh, the bottom of a, a smaller cycle. and especially hopefully on the bottom of a larger cycle to me when i look at this this uh these waves here the longer cycles rep suggest that we may actually be heading into a long-term uh, bottom in the long shipping cycle uh we don't i don't know for sure and i don't know what would <laughs> would cause the long cycle to go up very interesting to me though right but we do know by the way that the short cycle in um, the uh the dry bulk segment is very uh, elevated right now. So th to me, in my opinion, that represents a uh, higher than normal amount of risk in terms of an investment. That doesn't mean it couldn't go up from here. I don't know, but uh, um, I will explain that there is some very good behaviors that we see from the uh, shipping owners in, in the SEC that makes me um, more bullish on dry bulk than I am <laughs> on container ships. Now, I also want to mention there's an interesting pattern here I notice also. And I believe the reason you're seeing this overall blue line go down over long periods of time is actually because of the deflationary pressures that you see from more efficient types of technology, right? So we think about the kinds of vessels in 1850 that were delivering uh, dry bulk cargoes. They probably had a lot more human capital on them. They were probably... Um, didn't have the, the same kinds of um, navigation equipment on them. They were probably a lot smaller because they might not have been made out of um, high quality steel like we have today. They probably weren't even running on uh, the oil or the combustion engine during that time, right? So as all of these technologies come along, it tends to uh, push freight rates down in the long run when you account for uh, inflation, right? I wanted to show you this company. This is Golden Ocean Group. Number one, um, it's one of the dry bulk companies that I found that has been around the longest amount of time. And number two, there's just some very interesting patterns that you can notice in terms of their share price. When I look at this in terms of cyclically investing, I, I can actually see the cycles in the share price. So I mentioned a little bit below, I thought that the average cycle in uh, the dry bulk segment would be about, the short cycle would be about four years. And you can definitely see that in my opinion on this graph. So if we start maybe in about 2000, we can see that there is a, an uptick here uh, for about two years and then a downtick for about two years. In 2003, there was the beginning of that uh, super cycle that I'd mentioned a bit before. There was just a tremendous amount of earnings for a short period of time. I'm not sure why, because the there was a that big dip and we looked at the Baltic index, but then it shot back up. I'm not sure why this company's stock didn't go up as much <laughs> that much because i know and up until about 2008 there was the the bdi was still very high so maybe that's just an anomaly with this company maybe they messed up i, I don't i don't really know i know that some other companies were earning a tremendous amount of money at the time and we also saw a lot of um, public listings at the time which again are uh, a signs of those those uh, tremendous bull cycles when you see a lot of um, uh, public investment in these kinds of things right but as all cycles do they come to an end and you can see that went off a cliff and during the uh, GFC and then ever since the site the short cycles have been about the same every four or so years but the overall trend in this company and if you look at some other um, shipping companies has been uh, down now right now um, bulk carriers they're making a lot of money and uh, what is typical during this time is that the uh, the vessels themselves their net asset values tend to go up people are willing to pay more for them because they are earning money right so what is interesting though is just that there is a lot of 
these vessels being traded and shipped around and um, uh, purchases and sales going on right now. Uh, now, all at the same time, there is not very much scrapping, which you would expect, right? If you're making a lot of money, <laughs> it doesn't make a lot of sense to uh, be sending your vessel to the scrapyard. And you can earn money. You'll Whatever you need to do to keep that vessel operational, you'll do it until that cycle comes to an end. And then after a certain period of time, they'll go ahead and most likely send bin-worthy vessels into said bin. Now, that leads me finally into something that I really, really, really like to see in terms of owner behavior. What when you look at the dry bulk segment, this is something that really stands out to me compared to some of the other segments. Now, this is from um, one of these dry bulk companies. You look at new orders, new building orders, and the dry bulk segment compared to a lot of other segments and relative to it, it, some of the, own, the old history in even the dry bulk segment themselves, they are at some of the lowest dry bulk order books ever. And <laughs> even though right now they're making a ton of money. Now that might change. We'll see in the coming you know, months if there, these uh, high rates persist. I would expect these guys to be subject to some of the same behaviors as all shippers where they tend to go and, <laughs> and purchase new ships. But this is actually very impressive to me to see. And... This is why, although I think that a lot of the, uh, the, the earnings, both the bulkers and container ships are earning, are le earnings that they're receiving now are likely to be, in my opinion, transitory, ending at some point in the near future because of those extrinsic factors. If, if you're interested, go watch my container ship video. I'll, I'll put a link somewhere. I was talking about all of these things. In my opinion, this is just why I'm not bearish on um, dry bulk. Their behaviors are uh, so, thus far very good to see. That tells me in the future, because there is so few orders, the chance that there is a persistent bear market in this segment is less likely. Uh, I was watching a recent, this is an anecdote, I was watching a recent, um, uh, what do you, like a, a conference. You know how these, these shipping guys get together and they, go with the panel and they have a little shipping conference where they talk about their views on different things. I was watching this for like an hour and I was watching these different um, bulker owners talk about their dry bulk segment. And they were some of like, compared to some of the other shipping segments I've seen, these guys were like some of the most depressed people <laughs> I have ever seen in terms of like CEOs. They were just like, it was just like palpable. You could, they were like, whoa, this is like such a uh, um, stark contrast to like the uh, tanker owners who like are just excessively bullish for like no reason most of the time. But you listen to these guys speak and they're just like, they're almost ashamed <laughs> to be to be shipping dry bulk uh, companies, right? They're just like, the, the bear market has just like consumed them. So I think maybe, and I don't I don't know for sure, but maybe that is uh, part of this. Maybe they're just so accustomed to just lousy industry that that's actually causing some of their behaviors to um, potentially increase some of their earnings in the long run. So for me personally, that is one thing that I like to see. So in my opinion, and this I don't know everything there is to know about um, dry bulk. I don't know everything there is about container. I don't even know everything there is to know about tankers, although I know a lot about that one. In my opinion, an investment in dry bulk right now, um, based on my impressions so far, uh, is better than container ships, <laughs> in my opinion. Okay, so in summary, you know, I'm still just getting used to this segment. I'm kind of just watching this cycle play out, this short cycle to kind of get a gauge for the bulker segment, a feel for it. I like to observe different companies. And, and right now I don't really know a lot about, you know, the different managements of different companies. So for now, I'm not getting involved in this space, but just because there are, is just such a low amount of orders in a, what is a bull market right now is, is again, something that is really caught my eye in this space. 
I'll be making some more videos investigating this uh, segment a little bit deeper. And again, if you're interested in those, consider subscribing and I'll see you guys soon.